Okay, good morning. Welcome to Ag Talking Raw, where I talk raw about agriculture and other things that are on my mind. Okay, so I read a lot, and sometimes I read things that kind of blow your mind, uh, like this one. I'm reading the news, and it says, Woman sues Samsung for $1.8 million after cell phone gets stuck inside her vagina. This is crazy. <laughs> An Albuquerque woman is suing Samsung for $1.8 million after she ne she necessitated medical attention after inserting her cell phone inside her vagina and uh, was unable to retrieve it for 96 hours. I bet her friends were calling her, you know. <laughs> I wanted to see, this is what she said. She said, I wanted to see how it would feel to put my cell phone in on vibration mode inside of me just for fun. But it soon turned out to be a nightmare, she told Judge Andrew Peterson in tears. This is real. I'm not, I'm not making this shit up. I don't think it could. Samsung is definitely at fault here, as they offer no warning about the dangers of potential risks during the insertion of their products inside their clients, male or female body cavities or genitals. Salma Bryant's lawyer, Jim McAfee, said in court. Okay, so this is not the first time this has happened. To my surprise, as I'm reading this, it says, <laughs> Apple faced a similar lawsuit in 2014 after a man had attempted to swallow 14 iPhones and ended up in the emergency room for mercury poisoning. Apple was eventually forced to legally specify that their products were not fit for human consumption and the man was conceded an undisclosed amount of money. Okay. So Apple telephones and Samsung telephones, well, Apple's not sold in grocery stores, so naturally you would think that you wouldn't eat them. And Samsung, they don't sell those in adult stores, as far as I know. So why would you stick that thing anywhere near your genitalia or ass? I, I mean, I don't get this. It's amazing. It is totally amazing. So, Wow. So the other thing that I read this morning was that Hillary Clinton is going to be making a bid for the 2020 run. I mean, this woman won't just go away. She doesn't want to go away. I don't know whose ego could be so large that they just won't go away. I mean, when you lose, you lose. You're done, you know. Just go move on to something different. That's just my thoughts and my opinions. But, wow. Anyhow... Wow, I don't know. Some of this stuff just blows your mind. So anyway, I, I have to move on from there. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, I was watching a uh, I was watching some videos this morning at 4:30 because that's what time I woke up this morning, and uh, I was watching Jeff Raymond. If you don't watch Jeff Raymond, I suggest you check him out. He's a little dry, but he's got a dry sense of humor that I find enjoyable. Anyway, he was working on a Oliver 880. And he couldn't get it to start, and I'm almost yelling at my phone as I'm watching this thing. And uh, I'm going to explain something to him. Uh, he had water in his sediment bowl. He says he's got fuel, and he's got spark, and he had water in his sediment bowl. Well, when you have water in your fuel, it will foul your plugs. It's a pretty simple concept. It fouls your plugs. Now, you can have spark, whether you pull the plug out and check the spark. It, it'll spark. Spark just fine. And you put the spark plug in there, and the thing still won't fire uh, because your plug is, is fouled. Now, if you didn't know this, and it applies to all vehicles or all engines that have spark plugs, not diesels, obviously, but uh, spark plugs, uh, you, can, you can have an engine that won't start, pull the plug out, and drape it over the engine or short it out there, and, and watch the spark jump between the electrode and the, um, the, 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 yeah. God, why am I... Yeah, why in the hell can't I think of that name of that thing? But anyways, you can watch the spark jump. All right, but when you put it back in the cylinder and you compress air, you know, you compress your air, gas, fuel mixture, um, air is an insulator. All right, so when you compress air, the insulation properties become, uh, I don't know, 14 times greater or 16 times greater. I'm not sure what the... Uh, what the, uh, the compression ratio of that engine is in an Oliver 880, but you take 
that air that is, you know, no pressure on it, and it, it can just jump that spark. But when you compress it, the insulation properties of that air becomes whatever, 14 to 16% greater, or maybe even 18 to 1. I don't know what the compression ratio is. And now your spark can't jump the gap because there's fouling around the uh, insulated uh, porcelain part of your spark plug. So Jeff, you've probably got fouled plugs and all you need to do is change those spark plugs out and put new ones in and you're golden because if it is sparking with the plug out or even the wire jumping a spark to the, to the spark plug, uh, more than likely your plug is fouled and it's a simple plug change and you'll be good to go. And definitely get some decent gasoline in there, like some 93 octane uh, fuel, because those tractors were really designed to run on the higher octane fuels back in the day. Uh, it's just the way they were. So, little information for Jeff Raymond. Uh, what else is on in the news today? Uh, it snowed. It did snow, which is not good for me. But it's not the worst thing in the world either, because you know what? What can I do? I, I can't do anything. I know there's a lot of people that are uh, commenting on my videos. To One guy says, just hang up the year, douchebag. You know, you can't. I got half a million dollars worth of hay laying out in that field. You know, it'd be like, uh, it'd be like any one of you guys that farm corn and soybeans and you got some snow on it and somebody told you, hey, just let it rot. Well, you would never do that now, would you? I know I wouldn't. Um, because I've been in this situation before with corn and soybeans. I've combined beans on top of crusty snow. It actually combines pretty good. Uh, I will say, though, if you get crusty snow and you got to go cut soybeans, you may lose a few more beans by cutting it like that, depending on how thick the snow is. But, boy, does that combine slide over that snow real nice. And corn, doesn't matter. You know, you can pick corn as long as there's no snow on your corn stalks you go. My problem with hay is that it has to melt off before it freezes, and we are looking at a couple, three days of very cold weather, like 17 degree weather, which is going to kind of suck here because my coal stove melted down and I need to get a new one, and I just haven't, I think tomorrow's my day to go get a new one. I just have to do something with that, and yes, the boy is starting to whimper in the back there, so you're going to see a cameo, there she goes, and there she goes again, right, and so there goes Teresa. Uh, anyway, um, people are asking me if I'm going to grow corn this coming year. Yes, I have every intention of growing corn this coming year. I was going to buy a new corn planter and a new grain pl or corn head for the combine, but I decided that I don't think I'm going to do that. For 100 acres or 150 acres of corn, what the hell would I need to to uh, purchase new new equipment for? You know, I, I just don't find it to be necessary and, and uh, you know... I just don't think so. So this year, I'm going to just go ahead and use my four-row wide and my four-row wide corn head that comes on a TR-96 combine, which, yes, I do still have. Um, so that's just the way that works. Uh, that's the way I'm going to do it. Unless I get a wicked good deal on a six-row uh, corn planter, which would be awesome if I could. If I got a six-row corn planter with liquid applicator for under $5,000, I don't have to have a, a lot of money into it. I, I would definitely, oh, I'm definitely going to rebuild the, the four-row, uh, the, the precision planting fingers that are in it. I should probably just chuck those units out and put new ones in and uh, go for broke there because, you know, let's, let's face it, I'm going to, I want to have a good corn stand. Now, uh, forward contracted price for November right now in my area is $4.52 a bushel, I think. Uh, I did I did look that up, and uh, for this area, $4.52 a bushel. Of course, and it's going to cost me $0.50 cents a bushel to get it to where I need to go, so that's $4 a bushel for corn. Uh, not the worst. Uh, you know, if I don't have much in fertilizer other than the spent compost that I have, I think I can make a profit on that, plus the corn's fodder, which is a ton, ton and a half to the acre. Or a ton and a half to two ton, eh, a ton and a half to the acre with corn fodder. Uh, you know, there goes another... A ton and a half to two tons to the acre, depending on what my population is. I may do something a little crazy. Uh, I do have a GPS unit, and I may take that four-row corn planter and split the uh, rows. Yes, you're going to hear me correctly. I'm going to split those rows, make like a double-row unit, double-row corn planter in four rows, 
and go 16 and 16, have 32,000 plant population, or maybe maybe even 36,000 plant population. I could go 18 and 18, uh, and uh, 18, 18, 8 and 8, 16, 8 and 8, 16, 8 and 8, 8, yeah, it'd be about 36,000, 36,000. Uh, I think 18 and 18 is 36. My God, my math skills this morning are not working out too well. But I was thinking about doing that on one or two of the fields because a four-row wide corn head will just fold those right in and it'd be pretty cool to try it and then i'll get more i'll get more corn stalks uh corn fodder for uh for the uh you know for the uh for the mushroom composting soil guys and uh, that's just a thought that i'm i've had and because i have the gps unit i don't have to be perfect i just gotta it's just gotta work you know so four inches off either side, four to six inches, probably six inches, six to eight inches away from one another. I have to go look at a, say, a Great Plains or something to see what their spacing is or even just look it up on the John Deere website or Great Plains website and see how far apart they are. Because if they're eight inches apart, that'd be a whole lot easier. you got more room for error. Uh, I'll put a finger pincher unit on. You can buy those on eBay pretty cheaply for my Trimble uh, auto steer and go from there. I think that'd be kind of cool. Uh, just to experiment with it to see what it does and you know and then maybe uh, if I do well with the corn that again then I'll go into uh, maybe purchasing a uh, twin row you know twin row uh, what is that 11 11 rows or 12 12 yeah it'd be 11 rows I think with the uh, twin row or 12 or 13 rows whatever they are so six and six they wouldn't be it would be six and six so it's 12 12 row uh, twin row planner and see what happens I don't know, just my thoughts on the whole thing, whether my thoughts are correct or not, I don't know. Or maybe I'll just build a build one, build a toolbar and do it myself. Kind of be cool, nice winter project. Probably save me a bunch of money too. I can get rusty steel out of Fazio's, which is down here in Swedesboro, and go from there. Uh, that's just my thoughts on that. So $4.50 for a bushel of corn uh, would be, I'd be okay with that. You know, especially with the uh, fertilizer program that I would be uh, would be utilizing this coming year. Now, as far as baling straw this coming year, that is that starts in June. So my corn would have to be put in in May. I'd have to have everything sprayed and ready to go. I don't have to worry about side dressing or top dressing or whatever because I'll be gone for four to six weeks. I'll probably make a trip home uh, during the course of this uh, straw this straw just to see how the farm is going if everything's going well I do have to pay my bills which I can probably do online without too much trouble I just you know just have to do that uh, you know it's just some things that I need to figure out and uh, coming home to check on the house or whatever somebody's gonna have to feed the dog I just thought about that so maybe I have to get my mom to come over and take care of the dog or take the dog with us which I really don't want to do because the dog's a pain in the ass uh, the cat and the dog and whatever but uh, yeah, so that's that. Uh, but bale and straw is looking like a promising thing. Oh, and with that news, the uh, new baler comes on Tuesday. Yep, the new baler comes on Tuesday. And uh, we're going to put that to work as soon as the ground freezes, uh, which is a good thing. And uh, yeah, so that that's where we are with that. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, I don't know. I'm not buying a new tractor. I get a lot of people asking me what I'm going to pull that crone with. Uh, I can pull the new crone with either one of three tractors, the 7530, the 8120, or even the 7810. Uh, when it's up here, I'm probably going to put it on either this 8120. Probably put it on the 8120 uh, and pull it here because that tractor's got the power to do so. Uh, I could put it on the 7530. 7530 is... 208 horsepower that's what it dynoed at so I'm pretty confident that it's 208 horsepower which is a little bit more than the 8120 uh, they both have brake units the 7810 does not have brakes for the for the baler so it's kind of going to be a pain in the ass I'm going to have to I'm going to have to figure out which tractor goes on it down in North Carolina whether I take that 8120 the loader off the 8120 and put the uh, baler onto the 8120, and Dad just has to run the 7410 up here while to load Carl while I'm down there. I know Dad said that he wanted to come down and bale some down in North Carolina, so kudos to Pop. He can come down and uh, run the uh, baler if he wants. 
uh, or whatever he wants to run, stack wagon baler. He'll probably run the baler. I don't know. It all depends on what he wants to do. If he wants to do it or not, it's up to him. So that's just his choice. I just still need to have hay rolling off of this place to pay the bills as they come in because when you're bailing straw, you don't get paid till you're done. So I'll be working for six weeks with no pay and uh, still have to pay for food for the guys and and uh, you know the, for the crew and everything else that needs you know the the mundane stuff ins and outs of the of the job and uh, I do expect to expand on my bailing operation down down there uh, this is the first year for me to be a custom operator down there uh, I will be going, obviously, with the two crone balers. They'll be fresh out of the box and ready to rock and roll down there. And, uh, yeah, we're going to attempt to put no less than 45,000 bales through those two balers in this six weeks' time. Uh, I have a minimum contract of 30,000 bales, but I think the sky's the limit. I know what a crone baler can do in, in a day, uh, you know, pretty, pretty easily here. I can consistently run 350 to 450 bales a day in my small fields, uh, after, you know, chasing a hay rake. Whereas down there, straw bales easier than straw bales a lot easier than what hay does, and uh, you can run a lot through it pretty quickly, especially with the the crone balers. So I expect to be putting anywhere between 600 and a thousand bales a day through these through these balers. You know, 600 a day each would be awesome. So if I was to do <clears throat> 600 a day for the 45 days of work that I'll be down there doing, probably 40 days, I'm going to count on five, five days or six days, of, just say, yeah, 40 days, 38 to 40 days of actual bailing time. Uh, I don't care. It's, it's, we're just going to be able to do six, 1,200 a day. So 12 plus, you know, maybe 1,500 a day between the two bailers, 12 to 1500 a day between the two bailers would be pretty slick. And uh, obviously that's gonna put me well over 45,000 bales of straw if they have the straw available to me. Uh, my biggest concern with running this operation is not the bailing operation, it is the stacking operation. So if we get behind on the stacking, I'm going to have to grab a tractor and wagon, a loader and wagon system from someplace and, and grab these and grab these bales because I am not going to be behind I need to uh, keep up uh, as they say so I get right up the combines ass with the balers drop those bales and I have literally a day and a half to get all the bales gathered up so as long as my stack wagon is no more than a, a day behind me we will be ahead of the bean the the bean planters you know because they double crop everything down there so and i think we can do it i think this new stack wagon uh it's a bale runner 16k it holds 12 bales and we'll be putting that on the 7530 for sure because 7530 has front suspension and cab suspension and you can really rock and roll with that thing i mean we'd definitely be able to haul ass with it so that's what that stacker will be put on and uh we should be able to really do a good job if if I have to rent a tractor down there for some reason, whether I have a breakdown with one of the one of my tractors, uh, there's a John Deere dealer down there that I can rent a tractor from for no problem at all. Uh, it just seems to be the way it will have to be. So I'm not afraid to do that. Um, my my thoughts and fears with it is you know the amount of money that it'll cost to to rent the tractor. So they're generally three to five thousand dollars a month depending on what it is you know so yeah if i get an older tractor who cares you know 25 to three thousand dollars a month uh, you know but it does have to have suspension in order to run the stack wagon because that thing will fly across the fields uh, whoever's running the stack wagon they're going to be literally hauling ass down across these fields at 25 26 27 miles an hour uh, if I could find somebody to program that thing, I would have it programmed up to run 32 miles an hour, uh, empty 32 mile an hour across the field is no big deal with that thing. Um, and it'll just get done faster, or I'm going to have to rent a tractor that has 32 mile an hour capabilities. Um, I don't really want to buy another tractor, uh, depending on where we are with the straw, uh, you know, at, in the six weeks, whether, um, 
whether this is going to be viable or not. Uh, you know, I, I very fully well expect to just run my freaking ass off. I mean, we'll be definitely moving. The videos will be rolling, obviously, through, through the One Lonely Farmer uh, channel because it, it just does. Now, wow. So that's, I got a lot on my plate, a lot of pencils to push. I mean, I've pushed just about every pencil I can push, and, and the numbers seem pretty good for me. Uh, like, I should, it, it'll pay, you know, it will pay, it'll pay very well, so uh, I'm happy, I'm happy on that, on that front, um, and if this does work out the way I s expect it to work out, um, I don't do something unless I expect to make money at it, and uh, I don't do anything half-assed, at least I don't try to, Teresa's in the shower, um, I try to do things to the best of my ability and with pride and precision and get it done. I mean, sometimes I do things fast and sloppy just to get the job done, and I'm pretty good at that. I can wire tie shit back together again and go for broke. Um, but I expect to expand on this. So if I go down there and I do the job that I'm expected to do and they enjoy the speed and precision in which I get it done, which I think we will be able to do that, uh, I expect to expand by double next year. So instead of going with two balers, I go with four balers and not just four balers but four balers and another stack wagon or two more stack wagons just to get faster and faster and faster because the faster i work the more work that is down there and the more work that is down there the happier i will be because the money will just keep flowing you know and uh just freshen up the original crone baler just buy three new crone balers this coming year and uh, if it works out well buy three new crone balers, turn over my older crone baler, or just leave my old, my original crone baler up here um, at the farm until I get back and then use the older machines here on this particular job, you know, or whatever I have to do uh, here. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm going to have to purchase tractors and equipment like that. So it's probably going to be another million dollar investment there, which I'm not afraid to do. And I know there's a lot of good people out here on in the YouTube world that, uh, you know, are looking for things to do or maybe looking for an experience or maybe you're not you're a kid that uh, works on a farm and wants to, you know, go have an adventure. And uh, it, it will be an adventure for sure uh, because, you know, it, it's just something new and something different and and uh, for me anyway and maybe for some of my younger viewers that are like hey i'm 21 years old and my uh, i'm working on the family farm and uh you know i'm just looking to go spend a few weeks uh, working for some for say one only farmer and uh, we get a lot of work done in a short amount of time and uh you either enjoy your experience or you go home like that guy's an asshole and i don't ever want to work for him again or because you know when there's a job to be done we do the job and there's no excuses. There's no. There's no excuses. There is a contract you will be signing before you step on to the farm project, uh, because we are not playing games. This is a very serious business, which requires a very serious uh, employee. You know, if you come down there thinking that it's going to be a cakewalk, you're you're, you're going to be sorely, sorely, sorely mistaken. Uh, it's going to be you're in a tractor you are going to run for 16 hours a day. Uh, you won't actually bail for 16 hours a day, but you will be running for 16 hours a day. Those are the, those are the length of the days. So you got eight hours to get a nap and you know take care of your hygiene and whatever else you're gonna do. And the rest is, the rest is the rest. Uh, you just gotta, you gotta know that this is, this is not for the faint of heart. If you ever watch any other harvesting crew videos, uh, they'll run 20 hours, 27. I saw one guy, he says, oh, I've been up since for 27 hours, i got to go to bed. Well, he was the uh, support crew. He was running fuel and parts and pieces and, and working. And I, I kind of think that my role on this operation, my minor role is going to be actually bailing. I think that the uh, my actual 
real role in this operation is going to be the support staff. I am going to be the guy running with grease, running with oil, running with baling twine, running with fuel, making sure that the parts are all, everything is working right. If there's an issue, I'm the guy that's going to fix it because I have the most knowledge on the on that uh, particular particular uh, piece of equipment or any of those pieces of equipment. Obviously, uh, I will be working right alongside. If somebody gets sick, I'll jump in a baler or a stack wagon. If somebody if somebody gets hurt, God forbid, if somebody gets hurt, then there's going to be, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I mean, honestly, if there's a problem with the baler and, uh, you know, you're, you're to contact me and then I'll meet you in the field and we will we will swap either swap balers or swap tractors and i will figure out the problem with the machine and therefore there's no chance of a, a worker getting hurt by sticking their fingers where they don't belong i'll be the one that's walking around like this because i'm missing a finger um no that that'll be my responsibility other than miss ties and shit like that that's the only reason you'll need to get out of the cab if there's anything broken then i'm the guy that's going to fix it because i just don't need to have that risk i'm going to have risk management on this operation because I can't have people getting hurt and you know this first year it's going to be family members uh, with a few uh, guests like the Stony Ridge farmer he says he's going to come down and work for me you know that'd be kind of cool he said he could dedicate a week or two I don't know it depends on how much how much uh, he likes to sleep <laughs> you know I mean if he if he's up to work 16 hours a day for a week, excellent. He'll get paid accordingly. That's just the way it is. Uh, make some pretty cool videos, and uh, maybe he'll look at one lonely farmer and say, "My God, that guy's crazy," and I might just be crazy. But my whole goal in this life is to meet my goals and, uh, you know, retire with dignity and some money in my bank account, so that I can go do the things that I want to do when I want to do them, instead of just being like, "Oh my God, I got to go do this straw thing again because I blew all my money on." hookers and cars you know shit like that which i don't deal with hookers i do like old cars though i mean i really do like old vehicles i just love them old cars and trucks just my kind of thing tractors too you know uh, so anyway that being said i guess there's uh not too much else in news here for me uh I know that there's some guys here that are like sweating bullets with their grain They're still out in the field. Uh, there's a fellow up the road here. He's got 400 acres of beans and 500 acres of corn, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's 500 acres of beans and 400 acres of corn. And he's he had a grain dryer burn up on him, and uh, that put him behind a little bit because they had to pull the old one, the old melted down one out and put a brand new one in, which... Yeah, they're not cheap, man. They're like 60 grand for what he purchased, and, and it was nice. It's a nice one. Um, it, was a, it was a Baldwin, I think, is what he put in. Uh, I'd have put a GSI in personally or even a uh, MC. And the operation that he's got, I think I'd have put a tower dryer in instead because they just seem to make more sense to me anyway. Uh, heat rises, you know. And, uh, yeah, and that's just the way that works. So... I've rambled on for 28 minutes of time talking about myself, and uh, yeah, I'd like to actually um, see what is going on with some of my uh, some of my comments here. Now you're gonna have to give me a second because I have to actually I gotta double triple check that that thing is gonna go. Yes, and we're gonna go to oh Wesley, I feel slightly retarded. Today, I don't know why, I just do, but I need to go down and I'm going to click on my own video from last week using the OLF channel because the uh, I'm uploading to One Lonely Farmer right now and if I switch off, it will cancel out my, ah, oh, come on, it will cancel out my uh, upload and cause me a little bit of trouble. So give me a few seconds here, because I'd like to read some of the comments. There was quite a few comments uh, on the, uh, God, where in the heck is this thing? You might think that I, uh-oh, oh man. So anyway, <laughs> I do feel slightly ding-dongish right now. Did I miss it? Well, all right, let's see if I can just search. Ag Talk and Raw, Ag Talk in the raw there I am 
November 14th is the one I had four days ago. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Wesley. You figured it out. And I will read these comments. Ooh, what a nice advertisement, which pays some of the bills here. Okay, so we can do this. Come on, Wesley. All right, so, all righty. Um, yeah, today's the 18th, so that was four days ago, right? I'm going to do that and then that. I want to do my newest comments first. It says, you have considered, I'm going to add, answer, add, read some of these questions. So I don't know what they are because I haven't even looked at this channel in a, in a few days. Um, but what about slapping it on the 8530 for when you're at home? I don't know what that means. Uh, yes. Most of these countries already had steep tariffs on American goods well before Trump. Many countries benefit from developing nation status, which gives them a tariff advantage. Tart cherries from Turkey is a prime example. 58% tariff on U.S. cherries, but 0% on Turkish cherries. I'm sure Turkey negotiates for this when U.S. wants to use Turkish bases for military options. Damn politicians. This is correct. See, now, here's the funny thing. We're going to get into some politics and tariffs and stuff, because I know there's a lot of people that think I'm... I'm a fucking idiot, and Trump is uh, Trump is the guy that's throwing tariffs around like a wild man. Well, this isn't true. Uh, Donald Trump came into office, and when he realized, or he kind of knew this before he took office, because there's what you call a discovery, and he is allowed certain information even along the campaign trail. Once he wins the Democratic or the Republican nomination to become a candidate for the presidency against the Democratic or the Independent or the Green Party uh, uh, running, uh, com uh, yeah, opponent, uh, the Secret Service and the the Secret Service uh, give, gives them some protection, and they also get information on what's really going on in the United States, and so that they can research it a little bit and pick a few things out that are you know not top secret, obviously, but a few things out that he can point out on his uh, campaign trail as to what's really wrong with America. Now, Donald Trump knew that there was tariffs against the United States, whereas there are no tariffs for uh, those countries to ship goods to the United States. So just like this, uh, Patty Crisofoli has stated that there was a 58% tariff on tart cherries coming from Turkey, but, the, you know, there are going... 58% tariff of tart cherries going to Turkey, but 0% on the tart cherries coming from Turkey into the United States. These things have been going on for many, many, many years. The North American Free Trade Agreement Act, NAFTA, uh, which was put in place back in the early 90s, early to mid 90s, when uh, our lovely uh, President Clinton, Bill William Clinton, Clinton was in office. Uh, those were free trade to the United States, but yet there is a VAT on our goods that go to the other two countries in North America, one being Mexico and the other being Canada or Canada. So, yeah, so when those two countries can say, okay, we're producing goods, we can dump them onto your market and there's no tariff, you know, because it's free trade for us. But when the United States says, hey, well, you guys are giving us, you know, X number of goods coming into the United States and it's for free, but we, we want to send you something too. They put what you call a VAT. Now, that VAT is a value added tax. Uh, that, if you didn't know what the term was, if you see VAT, if you've ever traveled around the world and you've seen some, uh, this VAT thing or this VAT tax, that is value added tax. So, technically a tariff on the United States. So what was happening is these companies from the United States were like, well, shit, if we have to pay to get rid of our product to Mexico and Canada, we can just get cheap labor down there, build a plant, and then we can ship the stuff to the United States uh, for the same amount of money that we would normally uh, charge in the United States, but we can build it elsewhere and there's no VAT. We can sell it within that country, Mexico, Canada, or wherever, with no penalties or taxes. And, well, with tax incentives to get those companies down there, uh, which is unfair. 
And what it did was it created a trade deficit. So a lot of people don't know what a deficit is. Uh, they just think it's it's money. Well, a trade deficit does equal dollars, but a trade deficit is the amount of goods coming into the country versus the amount of goods going out of a country to the country that is sending goods to the United States. So the deficit is the amount of goods that are that are the amount the lack of goods going out of our country into the country that's sending stuff in. That's why the Chinese the trade deficit between China and the United States is so great because China wants to send all our shit their shit here. The American companies which were unable to compete in the world market because of the VAT or the value added tax or the tariffs that we were being charged to ship our goods out um, just decided, well, fuck it, we're going to move to the other country. We'll just go to China, we'll build the goods there, and we can send it to the United States for free. So that created a trade deficit. Well, where did China make up the trade deficit? Or where did the United States make up the trade deficit? And as you know, this is ag talk in the raw, the trade deficit was offset by a fair amount with agricultural goods, corn, soybeans, wheat, barley, rye, any of that stuff. Uh, hay, they actually send hay there for their livestock because they do. Uh, how do I know that? I'm in the hay business. So anyway, who sends it to them? Pacific Ag. Anyways, with that being said, the trade deficit is being offset with American grain. All right. Uh, so they're sending us our cheap plastic Chinese lead lined kids toys and we're sending them corn and soybeans. And and uh, that's kind of trying to make up the trade deficit, but it doesn't because American manufacturing has all moved over there. And now we're no longer building stuff here to send there. And there's only so much corn and soybeans that China can use to, to grow their poultry, pork and beef operations that they have over there because let's face it uh, little children don't say hey can I have some more soybeans for breakfast that shit doesn't happen they want eggs they want chicken they want pork they want beef and this is where John Q public doesn't understand well who cares if we're sending them grain well I've never bought grain in my life well no you don't you buy bread which is wheat you buy pizza, you buy cheese, which is dairy. You buy, uh, with that pizza, you can get sausage, you can get meatballs, you can get bacon, you can get whatever you want. You get pineapple, which comes from Hawaii and California and Florida, if I remember correctly, in the United States. Uh, but, you know, those those are those are the bargaining chips that can, or China has against us. They're like, well, fine, you're going to put a, ta a tariff on us then we're just going to buy our grain from somewhere else, even though that grain on the world market comes from the United States. They just don't buy it directly from us. And I've been saying this for, for months and months and months, and I know that there are some ignorant people that watch this channel that don't understand the world market. Uh, they, they just like, no, if they're not buying it from the United States, they're buying it from Brazil. Well, or Argentina or somewhere else, the U European Union or, or Russia, you know, Russia does produce a lot of wheat and Russia actually produces a North American grain uh, in higher quantities than any other than North America itself. And that is the sunflower, sunflowers. So sunflowers grow really well in Russia for, for some reason. And there's more sunflowers uh, grown in Russia than there are in the United States. I don't know. That's just the way it is. Uh, okay, so now I'm, I've done a long-winded uh, dissertation on uh, what's going on with tariffs and taxes, trying to explain in my crude way. And it is crude. I mean, I'm not, I'm not perfect in the way that I explain things in the world markets and stuff. But, uh, yeah, Jack Burton, I told you it was going to snow. Well, Lord willing in the creek don't flood, huh? I guess it snowed. But anyways, yeah, of course, I knew it was going to snow. I mean, I, I watched the weather. You can tell me all you want it was going to snow. I already knew that. And, uh, you know, pat yourself on the back like you said earlier. Just do this. It's okay. Um, are you going to haul tractors, balers, etc. to go bale this straw? Are you hauling? Are you hiring a hauling company? If my back was fixed, I would love to run equipment for you. Well, TJB, uh, I am going to hire some of the equipment hauled down, 
and I am both ways, and I just need to figure out what it's going to cost me to haul it down there. Uh, I do have a friend that has, well, Carl can haul some down, and I can haul some down. I don't have a CDL, so I can't personally do it, but I'm probably going to haul it myself. The uh, My 53-foot equipment trailer can haul it down, and let's face it, it's six, seven hours each way, six to seven hours each way, and uh, you know, it, it would be a sucky job, but yeah. We can get it down there. We can get it down there, and that'll do that. I'm probably going to hire a guy to help me out, and and uh, you know, no matter what, it's going to cost four or five hundred dollars in fuel, four or five hundred dollars for the driver each day, and uh, you know, it's expensive. It's just expensive, but we'll get it down there. Have you thought of making these in a podcast format? Since they are mainly audio, I really enjoy listening to them, but YouTube always shuts my off in my pocket. I don't know the difficulty or cost involved, but I think many would enjoy that. I think you're correct. I mean, this is more of a podcast anyway, um, but it, it it is. I mean, and a lot of people like to listen to my yammerings and my, my thoughts and, and uh, you know, observations and what I'm doing. So, yeah, maybe I should try and do that. But YouTube is YouTube's YouTube, and I, I do YouTube. I don't do podcasts. Can you send some rain my way? Driest on record here in thou- Southeast Queensland, Australia. And if I could box this shit up and send it to you, I would. Um, Wes, you don't mention anything more about raising chickens for the eggs. What is going on with that? Is that off the table since you're now going to North Carolina bailing straw? Probably. Uh, if this North Carolina ba- straw bailing operation goes the way I expect it to, then there's no need for me to get that many irons in the fire. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm, I, I'm probably going to, uh, I doubt it, but I'm probably going to get rid of some of the far out satellite farms that I run astronomical distances for just because it takes so much time to do that. And I'll just bring my hay business closer to home and let those go because I don't need to, I don't need to run around like a wild man trying to get this shit gathered up and get it, get it hauled when I don't think it's necessary. So, and putting on chickens is a whole nother operation. Uh, So, yeah. All right. I was in north central PA today. Corn still in many fields. Water laying on the ground. True. Very much a lot of water there. Keep it up. Nothing wrong with the truth. No, there's not. The newest way to screw over the corn farm is VOM or vomitoxin, which is, this is something that needs to be talked about, actually. Vomitoxin or VOM. We just get our deduction prices and if your vom is between four to eight you will lose from 15 to a ton to 50 a ton took one load to two places first sample was 10.2 the next place was 3.1 well i went to 3.1 because then you don't get that deduction but okay so you got vomitoxin now here's something a lot of guys don't know and this is where bailing off corn fodder could become uh, quite beneficial to you is uh, the the extraordinarily large levels of residue on top of the ground, or unless you're working it in, but on top of the ground, it needs to break down. And those vomitoxin, that toxins that are in the in the soil or in the uh, corn fodder, they thrive on that. So. You really have to manage your residue. Is That's where the VOM is. Now, if you take your corn off and you double crop it into, say, wheat, your VOM in the wheat will increase by tenfold, almost to the point where you can't do anything with it. It's not even cattle feed. It's, it's toxic. So uh, my suggestions to guys that are going to plant wheat, double crop it, double crop it into soybeans, uh, not into corn. If you do have to do it into corn, get that fodder bailed off of there or definitely shred it and get rid of it as fast as you can. I would never suggest putting wheat in behind corn because of the vom or vomitoxin. Uh, that's where residue management comes in quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, extensive. You really have to manage your residue. Too much residue can cause problems. Uh, in areas like here on the East Coast, we have a lot of clay soil and the the organic matter, you need organic matter, but there is a level of organic matter that will make your soil actually toxic with alpha, afla, 
and vomit toxins. So you kind of got to look at those things. Plus, too much residue takes more nitrogen to break that down, and it can, in fact, cost you more money in fertilizer or nitrogen costs to break down that residue to, to manageable levels over removing it and then adding the prescribed potash that you remove from the soil. Uh, potash isn't cheap, but neither is nitrogen. And when you mix nitrogen, when you have nitrogen uh, cost increase, and then you have that 15 to 20, 15 to $50 a ton uh, deduction for vomitoxin, uh, it's costing you a lot of money. So how much is, you know, how much money is, are you willing to risk for vomitoxin over uh, increased residue in your soil? Nobody plows anymore. Everybody wants, to, well, I say nobody plows anymore. Uh, nobody moldboard plows anymore. Uh, if you moldboard plowed that, then you may be reducing your uh, risk of vomitoxin, uh, but nobody does that hardly anymore because it is very expensive and time consuming here in the United States. So uh, in order to break down those corn stalks, you would need to spray down nitrogen onto those corn stalks before you plow them in or work them in. I see these guys going like Minnesota Millennial Farmer. They're running those corn stalks in with a, uh, I think they're running a ripper down. I don't even know what that machine is, whether it's a, uh, a vertical tillage machine or a, or a chisel, uh, a disc chisel combination uh, uh, that he's running. But without nitrogen, uh, you, they're not going to break down fast enough. And now there's a few new products on the market to break down corn stalks, uh, you know, corn fodder uh, in the field because of the increased levels of residue. Uh, so, of course, with higher population corn uh, on the ground, you're going to get more residue and it's, it's going to become a problem. Too much residue, you plug up your uh, corn planters, you plug up your discs, your, your chisel plows. I mean, I've seen harrows, everything. It plugs it up. So you really kind of have to manage that residue. Chopping it up in the fall with a shredder and then working it in would probably be the smartest idea, um, but don't put wheat after that. Um, yeah, so there's just so many problems and so many regional problems and so many regional solutions and so many ways that the middleman can fuck you in the ass over something that wasn't even a thing until 10 years ago. So vomitoxin, when I first heard of vomitoxin in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, when BT varieties came on the scene because the corn stalks didn't break down by spring anymore. They were just unbelievably uh, uh, vibrant, you know. Uh, they were in good shape, and, and uh, I remember going with a chisel plow and corn fodder, uh, corn that I had picked, you know, 150, 200 bushel corn that I had picked with corn with a combine and uh, plugging up a chisel plow. I mean, that's unheard of. But uh, after BT corn, uh, that was something that became kind of normal. So we would just run the disc over it. I only chiseled the uh, soybean ground and then I would just disc the uh, corn down in the, full, in the spring. So when I plant corn this year, it's going to definitely be uh, I'm going to work the ground. I'm going to kill it with Roundup, and I'm going to work that. I'm going to work that ground. Uh, I'm going to work down the uh, mushroom compost, and then I'm only putting 30 units of nitrogen down, and that's just to get that corn up and running. That's it. The rest of the nutrients will be there from the uh, from the uh, spent compost. So there you go. I like to grow corn. We haven't been able to pick beans in over a week. Cotton still got 1,200 acres of beans and 1,000 acres of cotton started out with 2,000 of both. Wow, you guys are behind. <laughs> That's farming life. Uh, when down in North Carolina, what are you going to do for a shop? Uh, the 550 will be converted over to a tool truck. I have the same mug, but it's red. Oh, yeah, my, my uh, John Deere mug. Are you going to buy a new float to move the equipment? Or hire that out float, huh? I don't think I have a float. It's a trailer, but no. We have a lot of stalk rot this year from the rain. Yes, I can agree with that. Somebody took the time to write out the weight differences between these tractors on um, on here. The 4960 weighs in at 18,370 pounds. It's 201 horsepower, not 210. Thank you. 7530 weighs 16,125 pounds. These are all bare bones uh, weights. Uh, 176 horsepower. The 7810 
even though mine dynoed at 100 and 208 horsepower with that dyno. 78, 10, 15,380 pounds naked, uh, 166 horsepower. The 8120, this is wrong. That says 20,235 pounds, which is correct, but the horsepower for the uh, 8120 is, is under 200. It's like 198 horsepower. Um, auxiliary brakes I have. Uh, 8530, 26,955 pounds naked. It has auxiliary brakes. Yes, it's 313 horsepower, which my my uh, 8530 dynoed at 374 horsepower. That's what that thing dynoed at. So 374 horsepower. That's a lot of snot. Um, he was talking about different tires and stuff, but it's definitely worth reading and, and talking about. Have you got a spot on with our UK. You have got it spot on with our UK, United Kingdom. Yeah, I, I forget what I said, but thanks. You know, I guess I did it. I did my research correctly. <coughs> Just choking on my own spit. For farming, buying used equipment is the only way to make and repair it if necessary. New equipment is too expensive. Well, when you're going to do what I do and what a lot of uh, what you would call commercial family farms or uh, you know, large farms, used equipment. I just don't see it, you know. I mean, I hate to say it. When you rely on that thing every single day and you need to get stuff done faster and faster. I mean, maybe when I was under, well, definitely when I was under a 1,000 acres of, of hay and, and corn and soybeans, which I was, everything I had was used. I bought everything used except for mowers because I relied on those, and they were cheap enough, you know, you could do it. But tractors and balers and stuff like that. Uh, tractors you can still afford to buy used. Uh, tractors, new tractors, uh, they're too damned expensive. I'm not spending three hundred thousand dollars or more on a tractor to to go bale straw in North Carolina. It's not happening. I can buy three used tractors for the price of one brand new one <coughs> and still be ahead, be money ahead, and and happy about that. So there you go. Used equipment, if you're a small farm, yes, used equipment is the only way you can go. You can look at the new equipment and say, wow, I wish I could afford that. But the reality is you go bankrupt doing it. I mean, I'm on the razor's edge all the time. And I'm pretty comfortable there, but I don't like, I don't like taking ginormous risks, even though I do it. But they're calculated risks. So, and I'm not afraid. Boy, that kid is screaming. I'm not afraid of, of stepping out on a limb as long as I know there's a path back from that limb. So, but anyways, with that being said, I got 52 minutes out. I hope everybody was, uh, oh, hope everybody enjoyed this one. If not, well, I'm sorry. Don't watch anymore. If you did, hey, tune in, tune in for Wednesday. Thanks for watching.